evening to all of you and welcome to this very wonderful evening. Uh, on Sunday, the 21st NIAS course for senior executives was inaugurated by Dr. Arun Shuri. And uh, this evening we have Sri Shyam Benegal to speak to us and uh, we feel it's a proud privilege that he could come in the context of this course. And uh, now I request uh, Dr. Kasturi Rangan, director of this institute, for a few welcome remarks. Good evening. Let me at the outset welcome my very distinguished colleague, Sri Sam Banegal, the NIAS associates, the participants to the 21st Senior Executives course, and my colleagues from National Institute of Advanced Studies. It's really indeed a very wonderful moment for all of us that Shyam agreed to be with us today evening. In fact, he had been here a couple of times earlier. Once, of course, seven years back, he gave a, came and gave a lecture at NIAS itself. And more recently, at the Gandhi, October 2nd, he delivered the Gandhi Memorial Lecture at the Ramanda Sach Institute. But we thought that that is not good enough. We need to have a separate evening with us for Sham, and he graciously agreed. And today he is with us in the context of giving us the benefit and sharing his thoughts on cinema, the secular aspects of our Indian cinema. You know, the associate program, as well as for the benefit of the participants of the 21st course, I should say is a pro is an idea that was evolved at the time of uh, Dr. Raja Ramana, the founder, director of this institute. The idea was to bring in the larger cross section of the Bangalore city century uh, once in a while to interact with the NIAS faculty and others, and thus provide an opportunity to get the share new ideas, new type of perceptions, even if nothing else, to have a good evening with uh, some of the most people who have achieved something unique in this country. So this program has been on for the last uh, several years in the inception of this. This has been further strengthened during the time of the second director, Professor Rudam Natsima. And uh, as of today, more than about 130 programs have been held uh, under this uh, particular uh, associateship function. The new initiatives recently were taken by Professor Setter and uh, Professor Shetty to see, to look at the membership of these associates as well as to see whether we should get uh, people who have now, there are many new additions to Bangalore and obviously one had to look at all those and there was tremendous response to reviewing the membership of the associate and I think they have moved, out, moved over to something like 150, 160 members of the associate. And I'm very happy to see quite a large number of the associate community here is with us today evening to hear Shyam. Uh, I don't think that I need to be introducing my colleague, Professor Sundar Saruka is going to introduce Shyam Nagel, but I can only say that uh, he has been a wonderful colleague so far as my Rajya Sabha membership is concerned, probably the best privilege that I enjoy being a member of the Rajya Sabha because his number, seat number is 99, mine is 100. So you know how close we are in, the, in this. So we discuss more than politics, more than the kind, and we are not very much perturbed by the perturbations within the house, simply because we have so much of agenda to discuss together that we don't worry about all that thing. And also many times we carry forward this discussion into the central hall of the parliament where over a cup of tea or a coffee, we spend hours of time. So, you know, it's, it's a very unique opportunity for me, and I think it is that kind of an experience that I cherish. And ultimately, when people ask me, what is the outcome of your association in Rajya Sabha? I think there are many, and one of the best things that could have happened is to know Sham and to interact with him. So, that's where it is. And I would like to once again thank you, Sham, for being with us today evening. And I would now call upon uh, Sundar 
to formally introduce the speaker for the evening and welcome to you all. Thank you, Dr. Kastir Rangan. It's a great pleasure on behalf of the Institute to welcome Mr. Sham Benegal. I should say welcome again because he has uh, given a talk at NIAS many years back before this auditorium was built in our old lecture hall. So I'm, we are very privileged that he has taken the time to come and address us again uh, after many years, actually. Uh, Mr. Benegal needs very little introduction, but um, for those of you who think he just makes films, uh, it would be of great interest to know he does a lot of other things besides. He's not just the pioneers of the new cinema in India, but if you look at the kind of work he has done, he has not only made about 24 fiction features for the cinema, but also he has done several documentaries and a TV series, uh, particularly uh, many TV series, and particularly uh, a 53 hour TV series on the history of India based on Jawaharlal Nehru's book, Discovery of India. While uh, the core subjects of his film have been varied in nature, but they are mainly centered around contemporary Indian experience. And in India today, if Indian cinema is one of the most important themes of Indian culture, he has perhaps shown to all of us that cinema is not just business, but it's also a serious art. Uh, he has an MA in economics, and in sp maybe perhaps because of that, he understands cinema in a much larger sense. We all know about his entry into cinema after his uh, initiation as a, uh, into the advertisement field uh, with the famous film Ankur. And his second film was Charandas Chor, and I mention this because uh, Mr. Habib Tanvir Troop is presenting Charandas Chor in our stage on February 10th as a public performance which is being organized by NIAS. Uh, many of you might have seen his wide range of films, particularly uh, one of the more popular films in the 70s was Junoon, uh, followed by Kalyuk. Uh, and later on, the serial which he has done for Doordarshan, which included, as I said, Bharat Ek Koj. In recent times, of course, he's continued his prolific filmmaking and allied activities. We remember well in Bangalore, uh, seeing the film Making of the Mahatma, which was in English, uh, which was running in Sapna. And I mention this because his latest film, which uh, uh, on Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose, The Forgotten Hero, um, in Bangalore, I must say, was uh, consigned to the PVR and Inox theatres for the 10.30 show, to the dismay of many of us. But his great art as a filmmaker is very well exemplified in this Netaji's film, and the best uh, compliment, in a sense, one could get is when Bengalis said that the film was wonderful and evocative. He has, of course, won enormous amount of awards for all his films. He's uh, known for not only for the international awards, but national awards. But most pertinent for us in this particular context is, is, uh, is the fact that uh, Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose won the best film on national integration at the national awards of 2004. And that also brings us to what he has been doing uh, with, uh, Ali, with a career along with making films, his great commitment to uh, secularism. And uh, I think it's very pertinent that today's talk on Indian cinema and secularism is actually being addressed by Mr. Danegal, uh, especially in the context of what's happening in Bangalore today uh, in the last few days. He was part of the National Integration Council from 86 to 89 and the National Council of Art. Uh, so I think in this context, his great experience, not just as an artist who reflects on contemporary Indian society, but also as a person deeply committed to certain fundamental human values, makes it very essential that we understand his importance on, on the, in his role in the Indian society today. It's a great pleasure to welcome Mr. Benegali. Good evening. For some of you here, this will be a bit of a repeat because uh, Dr. Kasturi Rangan said that the, the subject that I should be dealing with is secularism and Indian cinema. And this was in fact a talk that I had already given at the Raman Institute uh, a few months ago. Uh, 
I'd like to thank Dr. Kasri Rangan for inviting me here because it's a, it's a great occasion and a wonderful privilege to be at the National Institute of Advanced Studies. I was here many years ago when Dr. Raja Ramana was the director here. And uh, of course, when I came today, it's incredible how it has developed and grown. And it's a marvelous uh, feeling, you know, when you come here to see something that is thriving and doing so well. And um, I would like to come back again, of course, at, uh, which I will. But today, of course, what I would really like to talk about, you see, secularism, secularism and nationalism, these are terms that in India we, we keep using and we often get very confused by the use of nationalism, the word nationalism and secularism because originally what it was supposed to mean, particularly in Europe, very different from what it means in India. And there are many historical reasons for why they mean different things in India as from what it means in the West. Nationalism, of course, as far as the West is concerned, really, you know, when you talk about the nation in the West, you're really talking about a country that is defined by one language, one ethnic group, one religion. But when you think of nationalism in Indian terms, you can't possibly think that way, because let me give you some statistics. You know, India has 31 states, 1,618 languages, 6,400 castes, six religions, six ethnic groups, 29 major festivals, that's what we have. And uh, yet we consider ourselves to be a nation. Therefore, obviously, you cannot use the term in the same fashion as you might use the term in Europe. And therefore, I think there's often a great misunderstanding. If Western, from the Western view, when they look at India, they can never believe that India can actually be a nation. You know, in a, in a very trivial way, like a few days ago when this Shilpa Shetty thing happened, you know, and then how everybody became hyper-nationalist, you know, saying that she's in, insulted our person, you know, this Jane Goody or whoever was, uh, said nasty things to her, and all of us became so nationalistic suddenly, you know, and so that goes to show that the way we think of India as a nation is really very different, but yet it, it's something that happened because of the nationalist movement itself. Because the nationalist movement, the, when it started, and if it had to be, get the whole country together, the only way it could be done was to make it totally inclusive. And that's what Gandhi did, was to include everybody into the nationalist movement. And perhaps that was the one reason why because even today, when we talk about the nation, you know, a lot of people get, we are not sure, because we always have all kinds of problems relating to the idea of nation, like we have problems relating to the idea of secularism. Because secularism itself, again, is separation of the state from religion. You know, that's the only context in which it is used in the West. But in India, it automatically, it means something else. It means that we include, give, give uh, equal primacy to all religions, you know, within our body politic. So we talk of that as being secular, as against what the West talks about being secular. <clears throat> anyway, so um, you see, there it emerged from separating the state from religion in the West. In other words, secular state is exclusive of religion. In India, it evolved from the nationalist movement because the movement, the way that Gandhi used the movement, it was to, to, get, to get everybody together into one particular, sort of to mobilize everybody, he had to have everybody being accepted into the movement. And that is how we always felt both these, both these terms, like say being secular or being national, was to be part of the whole. And that is, that is the context I will have to use when I deal with popular Indian cinema. See, I'm looking at the reflection and representation of secularism and nationalism in Indian cinema from a filmmaker's point of view in the light of several key historical moments and events 
including the anti-colonial nationalist movement, independence and partition, and the creation of Bangladesh, and the rise of Hindutva in the 80s and 90s in India. I'd like to focus on the portrayal of religious minorities in Indian cinema, particularly post-independence cinema's treatment of Indian Muslims and the Hindu-Muslim conflict. While films of the Nehruvian era reflected the tolerant secularism of the state with all of its attendant problems and anxieties, the 70s and 80s saw the emergence of an alternative politics of minority representation with the rise of the new cinema, of which I'm, I'm part of that of, uh, cinema, which I will discuss at, at length later, and the creation of Bangladesh. And if the Hindutva dominated last two decades saw the proliferation of anti-Pakistan films, we witnessed simultaneously a return to a Nehruvian secular nationalism in the form of films like Lagan and recently a film like Lagera or Munnabai, for instance, that offer a serious look in a different way at the minorities in our country. In the late 1950s, Satyajit Ray, on being interviewed after winning the Golden Lion at the Venice Film Festival for his film Oparajito, referred to himself as a Bengali filmmaker. And Raj Kapoor, whose Jagdira who had won the Karloivari main prize, which was an equally important uh, award in Europe, was upset by this remark and wondered why Ray did not consider himself to be an Indian filmmaker. Now, the matter was resolved to some extent when Ray qualified his statement saying that he had meant that he was not a Hindi filmmaker and that there was nothing more to be said. Now, this, this is where you see you constantly have the kind of confusions. What seems to have upset Raj Kapoor was not that Ray made films in Bengali, but that he considered himself a Bengali rather than an Indian. In both their views, there seems to be a tacit acceptance that Hindi filmmakers were somehow more representative of India, while Bengali filmmakers only represented Bengal. While it is not uncommon for urban Indians to accuse religious and linguistic minority groups of not considering themselves Indians first and placing their other identities, be they religious, regional, language, caste, etc., above their national identity, clearly the self-defined secular nationalist Kapoor was reacting to what he perceived as the latent Bengali chauvinism in Ray's statement. On the other hand, Ray, in affirming his Bengali identity, was marking his difference from the Hindi-speaking Indian self that is upheld as the representative nationalist self in India. I've drawn on this anecdote only to suggest that the Indian national personality cannot be easily defined since it does not have any specific profile. In 2001, the Outlook Weekly, you know, invited a number of social thinkers, historians, public personalities to answer the question, who and what is an Indian? Vinod Mehta, the editor, chose to quote from a Hollywood film, The Party, in which Peter Sellers, playing a caricature of an Indian, when asked, who do you think you are, replies, in India, we don't think who we are, we know who we are. <laughs> See? And I believe that this statement, meant as a joke, actually expresses what most Indians know about themselves and are secure in that knowledge. The fact that we have a civilizational identity as Indians has never really been in question. And the source of its strength has been its proverbial ability to accommodate diverse and often contradictory elements within it. At any given time, we choose one or another of our multiple identities depending on the needs of the situation. We, we keep doing that all the time. You know, I mean, when you meet, you, you, you define yourself as a Brahmin or as a, as a Yadav or whatever, you know, at, when the occasion demands. At other times, you see yourself as a South Indian against a North Indian, or you see yourself as a Punjabi against Gujarati and so on and so forth. But eventually, when something like the Shilpa Shetty thing happens, we all become Indians. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, 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 it's one of those very interesting things about being an Indian. The structure of Indian society is a complex mosaic of various ethnic communities, religions, castes and sects that constitute the country. As the sociologist Andre Bethe 
says, all these communities are in fact the building blocks of Indian society. In the past, their diverse ways of life were neither discouraged nor challenged, but not, of all, not all of them were held in equal esteem. Since the traditional order of Indian life was based on the hierarchies of caste and religion, the tolerance of diversity meant tolerating a whole lot of iniquitous social behavior, such as the oppression of caste system, untouchability, and the perpetual subjugation of women. Moreover, accommodation of a multitude of beliefs and faiths did not automatically mean that individuals were free to choose from among these according to their personal inclinations. On the contrary, each individual was bound more or less by the customs and traditions of the community that he or she was born in. Secularism in India has always swung like a pendulum favoring the rights of communities at sometimes and the rights of individuals at other times. While accommodativeness and tolerance are qualities that are often quoted as necessary for a polity to be secular, an unequal and hierarchical traditional order does not lend itself easily to a secular state or society, nor to a democracy that enshrines fundamental human rights. Yet tolerance and accommodativeness did become important components of the nationalist movement under Gandhi and the Congress in the first half of the 20th century. Indian nationalism demonstrated that India's hierarchically constructed traditional order and the bewilderingly plural population were capable of functioning together. This was possible because, as historian and novelist Mukul Keshavan says, the independence movement made all kinds of Indians equally welcome without regard to creed, caste, and gender. Modeling itself on a pluralistic philosophy, Indian nationalism claimed to represent everyone in the country. This comprehensive nationalism was taken to be synonymous with secularism. Thus, to define oneself as an Indian was in fact to be secular. While the nationalist leadership was equally concerned with the need for reforms in traditional society, you, while, while the nationalist leadership was equally concerned with the need for reforms in traditional society, they were related primarily to Hindu society. It was felt that such reforms were not needed in either Christian or Muslim communities, as they were not perceived to be hierarchically constructed. Thus, while gaining independence from British rule was of primary concern, programs and agitations for temple entry to untouchables, gender equality, etc., were also very much part of the movement. To legitimize, to legitimize its claims to represent the entire country and to bolster its credentials, Indian nationalism, therefore, sought the adherence of various groups, including those that were marginalized along the lines of caste, religion, language, region, gender, or class. Yet sections of the polity, particularly among the Muslims, remained unconvinced about the Congress-led movement's investment in truly representing their interests, which ultimately led to the demand for Pakistan. Let me go on to examine the ways in which nationalist dreams, aspirations, and anxieties particularly around religious differences, are represented, managed, or contained in cinema at different historical moments from the inception of cinema in colonial India up until the present. Cinema as a popular new entertainment medium started early in the 20th century, around the time when the nationalist movement had begun to grow and strengthen its hold on the Indian imagination. The beginnings of cinema were small, and restricted to metropolitan cities. Most theatres designed for theatrical performances tended to double as cinema theatres. The first films to be shown were mainly from the United States and Britain. Soon enough, Indian films started starting as film extracts from theatrical performances to early feature-length films took cinema beyond its original novelty. Before long, films began to be made in different cities of India and had to compete for audiences with films that came from abroad. It was mainly for this reason 
that most of the early filmmakers saw themselves as being engaged in a nationalist enterprise. For example, in 1921, there was a Bengali filmmaker called Tiren Ganguly, who made his first anti-Western satire, which also had the unfortunate distinction of becoming the first film to be caught up in British censorship. Bhalji Pendarkar's Vande Matram Ashram, made in 1926, was banned, evidently viewed as a threat by the colonial government. In addition, films advocating social reform made by filmmakers like Baburao Painter and uh, Shantaram in Kolhapur and Pune went on to have bring significant influence on filmmakers of the region over the next two decades. By the time sound came to the cinema in the beginning of 1930s, Indian cinema had established itself as a major entertainment medium in India. This was also the time when the nationalist movement under the Congress had resolved to make Hindustani the national language of the country, not Hindi, Hindustani. Thus, films made in Hindustani could represent themselves as All India films with a pan-Indian appeal. Strangely enough, Hindustani films originated in cities such as Bombay and Calcutta, where the commonly spoken languages were neither Hindi, Hindustani or Urdu. As a consequence, filmmakers had to opt for an idiom that was simple and easily understood across the board. Both these cities had a flourishing theatrical tradition from the mid-19th century that was patronized by the urban elite. The Parsi Urdu theatre, both in Bombay and Calcutta, the Gujarati Bhangwadi and the Marathi Natya in Bombay, in Bombay, which went on to become the models for the unique and distinctive form that popular Indian cinema would take. While the genres of mythologicals and costume dramas were easily made with clearly set models from the urban theater, the real problem for Hindustani cinema lay in handling subjects of a contemporary nature. Making a pan-Indian film meant the construction of an environment and a culture that would be acceptable all over the country. Clearly, this invented national culture was a construct that lost over a great deal of the diversity that was part of India. People were presented in a generalized and eventually standardized way that would not identify them with any recognizable region. In fact, this system has carried on to the extent that now a lot of our films, particularly our very big films, very big Indian Hindi films that are made, are in fact Indian stories shot with Indian actors on locations outside of India. Like a whole film is shot in Britain or a whole film is shot in Switzerland and now of course Australia and so on and so forth. So you, you know the, the, the generalized atmosphere in which this is done, you are supposed to think that even Australia is India, you know, or Switzerland is India or Scotland is India and so on and so forth. So this, is, this started a long time ago. But of course, at that time, they didn't have the kind of money that was necessary. And of course, India was not globalized enough so that the filmmakers couldn't travel all over the place like they do now. Clearly, this invented national culture was a con construct that lost over a great deal of diversity that was part of India. People were presented in a generalized, eventually standardized way that would not identify them with any recognizable region. They were quite simply urban or rural, rich or poor, or identified by the social class to which they belonged. Though admittedly, the standard Hindi-Urdu idiom of these films marked them in some unacknowledged way as upper caste, middle class, and North Indian. You know, this, this you will notice as a pattern. They only had first names and no surnames. You know, this is another thing which is, which is the pattern with the Hindi films that you don't have, so you don't really know where they come from. Because surnames give, you know, tell you a lot about a person in so many different ways. They tell you the caste, they tell you <clears throat> the place where they come from, you know, all sorts of things. But if you don't have that, then of course you could belong anywhere at all. And uh, so surnames would give away their caste community and their regional origin. The only other identification was their religion. 
Hindustani films represented India in much the way nationalist movement did, identified mainly by the two communities, Hindu and Muslim. Regional films, on the other hand, were far more culture-specific and rooted in their communities in terms of subjects and their treatment. They could use their local idioms, customs, manners and conventions to make a greater claim on realism. Interestingly, successful regional films would often be remade into Hindustani, now culturally transformed to make them accessible and acceptable in all parts of the country. You know, there was a time, now they don't use that term, but uh, in uh, Chennai, in the film industry there, they, a lot of filmmakers, when they discussed films, like Tamil films, when they discussed Tamil films, they'd say, well, this film is good because it has nativity in it. You know, the, the term nativity is used in a very strange sort of way because it's not, it's not Christian nativity, it has nothing to do with Christ. But nativity in the sense that it has a sense of the soil. It, it smells of the soil, you know. So therefore, you, you evaluated a film on the basis of that. You know, because by the cultural specificity, by the kind of, uh, say, if, if there are rituals in the film, the kind of rituals that would be followed in a specific area of that state or whatever. And so that, they, they used to, that, that used to be the character as far as regional cinema was concerned. Now, Hindustani films were much simpler. You know, you were rich, poor, you had uh, no, no caste indication, but religion, yes, you had either Hindu or Muslim. And then, of course, you also had a certain, two kinds of genres. One was a genre of family socials, which were domestic melodramas or love stories set in a familial milieu. The stories they told were more like parables rather than realistic narratives. In the pre-independence era, a fairly large number of films dealt with socially relevant subjects such as untouchability in Achut Kanya, made by Franz Austin, who was an Austrian filmmaker who had, uh, who had been brought by Himanshu Rai from, uh, from Ufa. The Ufa was the biggest uh, studio, film studio in Germany at the time. And Franz Austin was an Austrian filmmaker from there. And he was bright, brought by Himanshu Rai to direct films in India. And he made the famous Achutkanya in 1936. Or, you know, I mean, and not only that, he made from 1936 to 1941, when he was incarcerated by the British for being an enemy alien, he made 19 films. You know, he made 19 films in Hindi. He didn't speak a word of the language, you know, in all this time. In fact, he spoke very little English also. And he was this, he was this extraordinary German who made some of the most successful Hindi films, you know, between the years of 1936 and 41, which is very interesting. Um, <clears throat> in Achut Kanya, for instance, the glamorous Devika Rani played an untouchable girl. However, there was no attempt at credibility or realism in making her look the part. What is more, the film was directed by a German filmmaker, as I told you, Franz Austin, whose ignorance of Hindi was only matched by his lack of knowledge of local customs. You know, this tradition in popular Indian cinema continues till today. The recent examples are a film like, for instance, a very successful film, which all of us have enjoyed enormously, is a film called Black. I'm sure a lot of you have seen this film. The family is identified as being Anglo-Indian because they speak English. Beyond this primary identification, everything else is invented. An invented world, an imaginational culture devised by the director. Audiences did not find this unacceptable and the film went on to become a great success. Hindustani films were accepted not because they created a credible milieu, but because they legitimized traditionally accepted social values that extolled the sanctity of the family and its primacy over the individual. Sacrificing oneself for the family, renunciation and redemption were common themes in these films. Traditional culture as presented in popular Hindustani cinema was not so much what existed in reality as much as it, rep as it represented 
a normative ideal, although reformist ideas frequently would be introduced into these films, unlike their counterpart, the Muslim social. You had the Hindu social and you had the Muslim social. Often seen as a twin of the Hindu family social, yet not quite a twin, a genre of Muslim socials presented a flattering image of the Muslim community as cultivated but essentially feudal, extolling virtues once again of self-sacrifice, loyalty, friendship and family honor. Hindus and Muslims as either twins or brothers in the family of India would eventually become a recurring motive in several Indian films before and after independence. Films of the period like Padosi made by Shantaram in 1945 and Hamrahi made by Bimal Roy in 1944 echoed the theme of twins. Interestingly, the separatist politics of the Muslim League never found a voice in the popular cinema, indeed often found ideological opposition in the cinema of the 40s and 50s. For example, Prithviraj Kapoor's play Divar, which was subsequently made into a film by him, represented partition as a threat to the unity of the family. It is not insignificant that writers and poets belonging to the Progressive Writers Group and the Indian People's Theatre Association came into the cinema at about the same time. Writers like Sadat Hasan Manto, Ali Sardar Jafri, Rajinder Singh Bedi, Sahir Lodhyanvi, Kafi Azmi, Khaja Ahmad Abbas and others brought a politically left-wing and overtly secular outlook to the films they were associated with. While most of them remained active in the cinema over the years, their early attempts were largely unsuccessful at the box office because of the radical views they projected. Popular cinema could not afford to give up the traditional values that were part of its appeal to the mass audience. Thus, for example, when eminent novelist Prem Chan wrote the script for Mazdoor, made by Mohan Bhavnani in 1934, it sank without a trace. Similarly, Sadas Hasan Manto's attempts to subvert the Muslim social with films like Najma, made by Mahbub in 1943, and Nokar, made by Rizvi in 1943, did not meet with commercial success. With partition and independence, a substantial section of the Muslim population became citizens of Pakistan, and India found itself with an overwhelmingly large majority of Hindus. One significant and far-reaching consequence of the division of the country along religious lines was that there was an increased ambivalence towards the minority Muslim community. Indian Muslims were perceived as continuing to have a choice in the matter of citizenship. They could either remain in India or emigrate to Pakistan. Their allegiance to the country was not taken for granted as easily as it was with other religious groups. Thus their nationalism was always suspect and needed to be ritually reaffirmed or proven. Simultaneously, protection of minorities, a commitment under the secular constitution, became the most important aspect of the newly affirmed secular state. This posed several problems for the Hindi cinema. How were Muslims to be depicted in the cinema? There was an awkward formality and a great deal of self-censorship in the way they were shown. Part of the problem had to do with political correctness and a desire not to offend. Muslim characters were routinely shown as sane, sensible, good and devout. During the Nehruvian era, many films, especially those that were written by progressive writers, strived to create the image of a secular Muslim. For instance, in the 1959 film Thul Ke Thul, Yash Chopra's first film, an old Muslim adopts an abandoned child whose religious antecedents are not known and sings a song to the boy, which in effect goes, you will not grow up to be either a Muslim or a Hindu, you are the son of man, so a human being you shall be. There was a great deal of tokenism as well with Muslim characters playing walk-on parts in attempts to represent the diversity of Indian society in cinema. Such sanitized representations were also due in part to the constraints of the government censor board, which would come down heavily on what it interpreted as negative characterizations of members 
in any minority community. Christians, on the other hand, were often depicted, you know, even now that tradition continues, depicted as good-hearted drunks, presumably because Christianity had no strictures against drinking alcohol. Communal harmony thus became a kind of signature in a large number of films during the 1950s and 60s. Hindi cinema soon came to be seen as a socially integrating force and the national awards instituted by the films, by the, for films by the government of India included one that was given for promoting national integration. Interestingly enough, while Hindi films found it difficult to deal with ordinary Hindu-Muslim relationships without sanitizing them, <clears throat> there was no such inhibition in regional cinemas. The most interesting part of, you know, the most interesting cinema is that of Kerala. But in Kerala, where there is a sizable Muslim and Christian population, intercommunal relationships were depicted in a far more direct and credible way. Ramu Karyat was one of the early ones who did that. He made several films, including Chemmin, that centered on intercommunal love stories. This was possible because Kerala had not been affected by the trauma of partition, despite having communal and caste-based parties and associations. And perhaps also because Malayalam films did not seek to represent themselves as Indian films, you know, the national films. So that, that, since that was not a burden on them, they could do all this. Muslims in Kerala did not experience the kind of social insecurity and diffidence that the sections of Muslim community felt in northern India after partition. By contrast, Hindi cinema was self-consciously secular in its attempt to make the minority Muslim community feel accepted and socially secure. Yet it often reflected and performed the paternalistic duty of, a, of an avowedly secular Indian state towards Muslims. Consequently, however benign it may have appeared, the secularism of Hindi cinema of this era reflected to a large extent the secularism of the state, which was at best patronizing and at worst wishy-washy and uh, dealing with the community with kid gloves. The formulaic representation of Muslims and other religious minorities continued through 1950s and 60s. It was not until the early 1970s that things began to change and Hindi cinema found it possible to tackle subjects related to partition and the contemporary Muslim experience, which until then were considered awkward subjects liable to inflame communal passions. Strangely enough, you know, I mean, the, 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 this, this is not completely gone because, well, two days ago you had this problem in Bangalore, for instance. But I, I personally think that this has really nothing to do with religions as much as it has to do with political parties, you know, rather than religion as such. And this, of course, has been the problem in our country ever since the 1980s, where you, where you have political religion playing a very important part in our, in our body politic. So, two significant developments paved the way for an alternative politics of minoritarian representation. The creation of state-established institutions like the Film and Television Institute of India and the Film Finance Corporation that enabled the emergence of the new cinema. And secondly, the second partition of the subcontinent in 1971 that led to the creation of Bangladesh. Let me lay out some of the material conditions that led to the emergence of the new cinema and then provide a brief survey of some of the more important films that placed minority communities at the center of their narratives. I would like to examine the significance of the creation of Bangladesh in 1971 and how it made possible the production of films like Garmhava made by Satyu that treated the subject of partition in a realistic manner for the first time in Hindi cinema. To understand, <coughs> sorry. To understand the importance of the new cinema, it would be important to situate some of the developments that took place in the cinema of post-independence period. 
Indian cinema was already a flourishing industry at the time of independence. It was totally market-driven and unregulated. Financial booms and busts were very frequent. This prompted the government of India to set up a committee to look into the affairs of the film business. The committee made several far-reaching recommendations that would set the course for the cinema in the next 50 years. Among the recommendations were the setting up of a fund to finance filmmakers to make children's films, to make uh, the, I mean, uh, an institution to teach filmmaking, a uh, children's film society to encourage uh, filmmakers to make children's films, the creation of a national film archive, and so on. There were other recommendations too, which were not particularly helpful to the cinema, such as the levy of an entertainment tax on film screenings. Since cinema was not understood to be socially productive by the state, the tax was quite punitive in nature. Moreover, since the provincial governments, not the central government, because this is not a central government subject, it's a state subject, levied the entertainment tax, it varied from state to state. 55% of the price of a ticket in Maharashtra, going up to 132% of the price of the ticket in Uttar Pradesh, and 146% of the price of a ticket in Bihar. The center is now recommending, of course, a 30% tax across the country, but I don't think states who are used to getting such huge sums of money from the film industry are going to change so quickly. The government, in effect, ended up by earning much more from films than either the film producers, distributors, or exhibitors. As a result, the old studio system became unsustainable and gave way to independent entrepreneurs and speculators. Filmmaking became a far more speculative and high-risk business than it had ever been in the past. In spite of this, the film business grew by about 8 to 10 percent each year due to the phenomenal growth of cities, towns, and new urban townships in the wake of industrialization and other programs of economic development. In fact, today, you know, the Indian film industry is going through a huge boom period because the, the growth is an average of between 20 to 22 percent annually. It's incredible, you know, I mean, it's in the, the, and this growth has largely been fueled because of the multiplexes that have come up in some of the major towns of India. And the multiplexes, the, the earnings from a multiplex for the first five years are not taxed. You know, what, and what this has meant <clears throat> is that you have suddenly corporate sectors looking at films as a business to get into. And so there's a large number of corporates who are already in the film business today. You know, the Ambani's are in the film business, Birla's are in the film business, the Tata's burnt their fingers and got out quickly, the, you know, and so on. So, you know, you have different, different kinds of corporates who are still in that business. But anyway, let me go back to what I was saying. The complexion of the audience, too, began to change. The older middle class was no longer the arbiter of taste in the cinema. A growing new middle class, an increasing working class, and vast numbers of recent immigrants from the countryside into towns started to play their part in determining the aesthetics of the cinema. Films had to meet their entertainment needs since they constituted the largest segment of the audience. The effect of all this started to be felt in the popular cinema of the 1960s. The common denominator of films got lowered and widened to appeal to the largest number of people. Consequently, there was a growing concern in the state establishment that the increasing number of films being made each year did not indicate any improvement in the quality of cinema. The most frequent criticism was the popular cinema aped and plagiarized Hollywood films and was not Indian enough. <coughs> this concern paved the way for state-sponsored funding agencies that would help promote a different kind of cinema, one which was not necessarily designed to meet the perceived demands of the marketplace. By this time, Satyajit Ray had arrived on the scene with his highly celebrated cinematic works. His films were not only successful at the box office in his native Bengal, but were critically acclaimed all over the world. Even today, 
in many countries of the world, the only Indian filmmaker they know is Satyajit Ray, despite the fact that Indian cinema has made huge inroads in the foreign markets. But this has been restricted to the Indian and South Asian diaspora rather than to the local populations of those countries. The only, only person they know is Satyajit Ray, even today. Ray's films, along with those of his two other contemporaries, Ritik Ghatak and Brinal Sen, were not simply vehicles of mass entertainment. Apart from their artistic qualities, they were seen as closer to Indian reality and life. Ironically, given Ray's own resolute sense of Bengali identification for cineasts and critics outside India, Ray's films represented India. Ray's cinematic aesthetics thus set the tone for the various institutions the state established for the cinema. The most significant of these was the Film and Television Institute and the Film Finance Corporation. By the beginnings of the 1970s, graduates from the Film Institute were making films funded by the Film Finance Corporation, which attempted to provide a more realistic depiction of contemporary Indian life. Moreover, after 1971, Another factor helped in boosting the prospects of such films. The import of foreign films was cut down drastically, leaving a large number of cinemas, particularly in metropolitan cities, with available playing time. These cinemas catered mainly to a niche audience whose taste did not extend to popular Hindi cinema. Encouraged by the response, several private producers began funding films of this kind. All my films made in the 1970s and 80s were funded by such producers. If popular cinema worked on the basis of tried and tested formulas in which religious and ethnic minorities rarely, if ever, took center stage in a film, if a Muslim, for instance, was to be a, a, a protagonist in a film, it could only be in a Muslim social. Otherwise, you would hardly have a Muslim being a, a, a you know, central character in a film that had other communities. What was especially significant about the new cinema was that freed of the constraints of the marketplace, it was able to take on a variety of complex social subjects. In 1969, Manikal, a graduate from the Film Institute, made his first film, Uski Roti, in which the central character was a Sikh, which in itself became a political statement against the unmarked Hindu hero of much popular Hindi cinema. One of the most significant films to be financed by the Film Finance Corporation was M.S. Satyu's Garmhava. It was the first film to grapple with the experience of Indian Muslims in the immediate aftermath of partition. As I've argued above, until Garmhava was made, Muslim characters in popular Hindi films were routinely depicted in token roles and often without blemish. In this way, they were separated from the community, effectively making them the other. Based on a short story by Ismat Suktai and written by Kafi Azmi, Garm Hawa attempted to recreate the predicament of a North Indian Muslim family reacting and responding to the extraordinary circumstances during the time of partition. The family has to make the painful choice of whether to stay on in their ancestral home in Agra or leave for Pakistan. The film's narrative maps the gradual breakup and division of the large joint family as individual members depart from Pakistan for various reasons. However, unlike his relatives, the protagonist Salim Mirza refuses to migrate to the new Muslim nation given his attachment to the place, in this instance, Agra. The film traces the gradual breakdown of Salim Mirza's fortitude in an atmosphere of growing distrust and suspicion against Muslims in post-partition India, leading to his eventual painful decision to emigrate along with whatever is left of his family. However, inspired by a communist procession affirming the solidarity of the oppressed, the film's final sequence has Mirza and his younger son Sikandar reversing their decision in spite of all their travails. Despite this affirmative secular nationalist closure, Garm Hawa remains the only film to address the plight of Muslims in post-partition India in the early years after independence. Ironically, the film found itself in a great deal of trouble 
with a section of the Muslim community who appealed to the government to ban the film. The censors themselves could not make up their mind. It was only several years after it was made that the film was finally released. When it did get to be seen all over the country, it was only via television, unfortunately. If the establishment of state-funded agencies aided the production of films like Garmhava, I believe that the historical moment was also an important contributory factor that enabled the film's production. It is not insignificant that Garmhava was produced after the 1971 creation of Bangladesh. While the first two decades after independence continued to be a, a period of migrations for Muslims, since Pakistan was still an option, this option effectively disappeared after the creation of Bangladesh. In addition, this new partition, this time of Pakistan, along linguistic lines, also aided in containing some of the anxieties around Indian Muslims. The commitment of Muslims to India was suddenly no longer a matter of doubt or nationalist anxiety, except among extremist Hindu groups for purely political reasons. And therefore, Satyu could choose to take on a subject that until then had been avoided or only referred to in oblique gestures by most popular filmmakers. A film of this kind would have been impossible to make before 1971. Several stories dealing with contemporary Muslim experience found articulation during 1970s and 80s in the new cinema. Muzaffar Ali made a film called Gaman in 1978 and a film called Anchuman in 1986, the former about a Muslim taxi driver in Bombay and the latter documenting the life of a Muslim chicken worker in Lucknow. Satyajit Ray made Chatranj Ke Khiladi, set in 1857, based on a Premchand story, and I made Junoon on incidents in an Uttar Pradesh cantonment town that related to the experience of various communities, Hindus, Muslims, Anglo-Indians, and the British who found themselves caught up in the uprising. Soon after, Saeed Mirza made the film Albert Pinto Ko Gussa Aata Hai in 1980, about a Goan Catholic family in Mumbai, and later made Salim Langre Par Matro on a young thief in a Muslim ghetto. I made a film called Trikal in 1985 on a privileged Catholic family set in a Goan village at the time of the liberation of Goa. The earlier diffidence that filmmakers felt in tackling subjects dealing with minority communities was replaced by new confidence. Sterile representation of the minority is very much part of the Indian cinema before 1971 were replaced by films on ordinary people grappling with problems of life and change in a modernizing world. Several of the films mentioned earlier had a favorable audience response and some of them were reasonable box office successes. However, the first film to take up the issue of Hindu-Muslim divide during partition was a mini-series based on Bisham Sani's novel Tamas by Govind Nehlani. It, this was made in 1987, by the way. Fortunately for the series, it did not require to be cleared by the censor board as it was made for television. Otherwise, the censors would have banned it on grounds that it showed hostility between the communities. While the national television channel Doordarshan was considering telecasting it, the RSS and some of its other constituents objected violently to the screening. Nilani's apartment in Mumbai was attacked and threats were threats were issued against his life. As a result, Doordarshan decided against showing the series, citing a threat to peace, as right-wing Hindu organizations had also threatened to burn down the television station. Nehalani went to court and the Bombay High Court, after viewing the series, directed Doordarshan to show it, as there was nothing unconstitutional in the film to warrant a ban. It was only then that it was shown in its entirety on prime time to record audience over three evenings, which passed off without incident. In 1986, when the government under Rajiv Gandhi overturned the Supreme Court judgment in the Shah Banu case by amending the constitution, it did irreparable damage to the secular credentials of the country. It was with some justification of not being even-handed in the treatment of religious communities. 
The political consequences were far-reaching. It brought the Ram Janmabhumi issue to the forefront, which led to the destruction of Babri Masjid, once again sowing the seeds of suspicion in the minds of both Muslim and Hindu communities. In the aftermath of the Shah Banu case, I embarked on a major television series, Bharat Ek Coach, based on Jawaharlal Nehru's discovery of India. The book itself, for all its flaws, strived to construct and, uh, construct and define India's pluralistic heritage and outlined a secular vision for the country. While the Ramayana and Mahabharat had the highest television viewership ratings in India, Bharat Ek Coach came a close third. In its repeated telecasts, it continued to have a pretty high viewership. Following the emergence of the BJP in the 80s and 90s in India, new changes could be noticed in popular cinema. Given the tense standoff after the nuclear test by India and Pakistan, patriotism bordering on anti-Pakistan jingoism became a major theme of popular Hindi cinema. While this was to be expected, the definition of nationalism and by implication secularism was considerably narrowed and made the exclusive preserve of the Hindu community. For example, in J.P. Datta's film Border, which was made about 10 years ago, which deals with one of the battles of the Indo-Pakistan War of 1965, there is considerable stress on Indian, which means Hindu in this case, generosity against Pakistani, which means Muslim, intransigence, where Pakistanis and Muslims are made synonymous. Now, the excessive jingoism is even more crudely depicted in a film that was made six years ago for Ghadar. Both films were huge box office hits and especially successful in the North Indian states. However, if the rise of Hindutva politics had led to the production of a range of anti-Muslim films, it also gave rise to hugely successful films like Lagan, which equate an in inclusive secular unity with nationalism. Moreover, the last decade of the 20th century also saw the emergence of films like Mammo, made in 1995, Naseem, 1995, Fiza in 2000, and Bombay, that reflected upon the place of Muslims in Indian society. Now, recently, last year, a film called Rang de Basanti, which had, an, again, the same kind of concept of secular nationalism. Now, after the horrific Godra incident and the widespread and brutal retaliatory killings and arson in Gujarat five, four years ago, aided by the non-action of the state, India was poised at a critical juncture. Would Indian secularism hold the country together or would it succumb to the ideology of Hindutva, leading to a dangerously divided polity? According to me, the coalition that came to power two, two three years ago now changed the picture in many ways. What is fascinating is that despite the most provocative bomb attacks in Banaras, Mumbai and Malegaon last year, the expected communal carnage did not take place. Before I conclude, let me leave you with a quotation from a Harvard Law School professor, Lani Guinier. The best barometer to measure the health of society is to look at the condition of its minorities. The minorities are like the coal miner's canary. It is the canary that is the first to notice toxic gases in the coal mine. If the condition of the minorities is insecure, then the civil society cannot be seen as being healthy." Unquote. The imaging of minorities in popular cinema actually constitutes an excellent barometer of public attitudes in the cinema. Thank you. We could take some questions. Please raise your hand so that I can identify. Okay, I see a few hands. Uh, among the participants, uh, okay, Mr. Arora, please. Can you please give the mic? Thank you, sir, for uh, an extremely scintillating uh, uh, lecture, uh, most interesting, and I think. This would really be remembered uh, by all of us for a very, very long time to come. Uh, well, uh, you spoke of uh, 
uh, Indian cinema in the international uh, context. And uh, you particularly uh, emphasize that uh, Satyajit Ray is the only director who is more or less universally uh, acclaimed. Now, uh, well, firstly, sir, uh, without in any way undermining the, uh, the important role played by the so-called non-commercial or unconventional or art cinema, but uh, I feel that at the end of the day, uh, isn't it perhaps too much to expect from filmmakers, from the film industry, to play the role of social activists, be it in the form of uh, national integration or trying to define Indianness, trying to define this, you know, very very uh, difficult concept of what nationalism in India means, be it. Uh, trying to uh, uh, be a catalyst for promoting uh, secularism. I think it might be uh, perhaps better to really look at uh, cinema uh, as uh, a medium of entertainment. I mean, I, I know I, I speak in, in very perhaps uninformed, uneducated and colloquial terms, but uh, uh, having traveled to several countries, uh, I'll, I'll give you a small example. You know, my, my first posting as a diplomat in, in Cairo, well, we had a difficult time to get uh, an actor from India for the Cairo International Film Festival, which is uh, in its own right quite acclaimed. And finally, at a very short notice, we had Kumar Gaurav. Now, uh, as the cultural officer, I took him around, and if you introduced him as Kumar Gaurav, nobody even looked at him. But when you told people that uh, he's related to Rajendra Kumar, you know, immediately all Egyptians, they were gaga over, you know, this film Sangam. So, I mean, it, it touched a certain uh, emotional chord in them because good music, good story, whatever, good entertainment. Uh, Carlo Vivari in the Czech Republic, you know, they still remember Mother India. And in a globalized world, in, in today's uh, milieu, well, uh, uh, for all the criticism that we often uh, make of uh, Bollywood, but I think uh, uh, that's, that's perhaps uh, one of our, our most effective ambassadors, you know, to earn us uh, uh, international uh, goodwill and uh, uh, also for the Indian audiences, as you said, that uh, if, if you want a globe, uh, a sort of tour around the globe, just see a few Bollywood films, you know, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, I think that is what they, they seem to believe in. So I, I just uh, uh, wanted to throw these ideas and, uh, you know, seek your uh, comments. Thank you. Sure. Uh, hello. Yeah. You see, uh, I, we all know that cinema, the primary job of cinema is to entertain. But I, I believe that the effect of cinema goes well beyond entertaining people. You know, this is one of the things about cinema. One of the things is that it is a very, very effective, effective kind of um, communication system which impacts you in so many different ways. Most people, when they make uh, films, are not even conscious. You see, like of, of the, the, the examples that I gave about, you know, how we filmmakers have dealt with the um, with ideas of nationalism and secularism, it wasn't as though they were thinking about it. It was just that they were working on the basis of the kind of experience of their audience. You know, because they have to reflect a kind of what the audience really feels like or does, because that's the only way you can be successful. So it's, it's, that is what it is. And then, of course, if you, if you look at it from uh, another point of view, look at American cinema, look at Hollywood. You know, uh, Hollywood has done more to, to seduce the world to the American dream and the American way of life. And in many ways, I think Hollywood had a very important role to play in the dismantling of the Soviet Union you know, in some ways, because it, it did play a very important part in all that. So it is, what I was saying was that I was looking at it in terms of analyzing. I'm not, I'm not saying that filmmakers should self-consciously sit there and do this, but I do believe one thing, that filmmakers, because they have the kind of power they have, you know, the kind of power they have, it is, they, they should not become unconscious of the kind of impact their films have. And it's very important that they, they, they should become conscious of this, because if they're not, then you can do terrible things. Because you see, J.P. Datta, when he made 
when he made border, he was quite unconscious of the fact that what he was doing was making a very kind of, uh, you know, a, a statement that was only strengthening divisive forces in so many ways, you know, between communities. He wasn't even conscious of that. You see, that, that that's, that's the point I'm trying to make. The fact is that there are certain times, you know, in in, 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 in the country's experience, when they, you move from one to another kind of, the sentiment moves in different directions. And filmmakers tend to catch that sentiment, you know, if they have to be successful. May I also request that you please limit the comment to the question from 45 to 60 seconds so that we can take more <laughs> questions. Uh, you walked us through a, a couple of decades of uh, cinema, both uh, what is that, uh, without sound and the post-sound era. And you gave us a lot of views on you know the Muslim people within the Muslims being depicted in various social themes. And uh, uh, an analogy of the naming convention that their you know, surname is dropped and uh, so that one couldn't identify whether uh, what religion that person is playing that role on. Uh, I just want to uh, uh, hear your comment on the fact that actually I was waiting for you to come to the present era of uh, 2000 and 1990s late and all that. Most of the stars, the ladies and the men folk, are all uh, from the Muslim community. You take the King Khan and uh, this chap, uh, various other, Salman Khan and uh, Dilip Kumar and various other players. See, they have come to uh, play such important roles. In fact, today, today there's no problem like it used to be. In the past, there was a problem. Like, say, for instance, you know, during the time of the nationalist movement, a lot of people, even political figures, gave up their surnames. You know, I mean, Jay Prakash Narayan, you, just by uh, calling him Jay Prakash Narayan, you wouldn't know that he was a caste. You wouldn't know that. Because, you see, they, they, they removed that, whether they were Saxenas or Mathurs or whatever, they didn't put those names. Now, again, it, it has come back because now it doesn't really matter. But you see, in the cinema, it was done similarly to, to sort of a blur the difference between communities, in Hindi cinema particularly. It was done to blur this difference. And, because, and it was following the whole nationalist uh, movement, you know, in the same kind of thing. Of course, now it doesn't really matter because everybody, like, you know, different, different, uh, you don't have people who, because today you, somebody calls himself Ayer, is no problem. But there was a time when you called yourself an Ayer would be a problem. You know, this, so these kind of things. This is in the cinema. This is the, so it it in many ways reflects what are the major things that are happening in society at any given time. You see, that's why, like, say, for instance, today when you make films, and you know, if an Indian story is taking place in Scotland or something, it's not a story of NRIs. It's a story of Indians. You know, in New York, it's not an NRI story. NRI stories are there, be, being made by NRIs. But I'm talking of Bombay film producers making films in all these different places, and they don't identify the place, you know, as anything. It's just a backdrop, and it's an attractive backdrop because you're also going showing that you're. We are all doing extremely well, and we are a very prosperous bunch of people, you know. <laughs> Hello. Yes, please. We talk so much about communism these days the communalism of the minority and the communalism of the majority. Don't you think the communalism of one religion or the group, the minority, reinforces or fuels the communalism of the majority and vice versa? Absolutely. Unquestionably. That's it always I does that. Know. It always does that. See, that, that's, that's, the, that's the whole scheme. You see, one of the things that Nehru always said that majority communalism was far more dangerous than minority communalism because you could contain that while this could, could remain uncontained. You know, so there's a danger there. Because these days, the communalism of the minority is viewed in a different context. It is viewed as an assertion of rights. Yes, okay. Let's, 
and fight for some prerogatives could it be understood in the same way when it comes to the communalism of the majority see there is a sense of victimhood which is very easy among uh, among minorities a feeling of being victims is a very easy thing because you know the because the the sense of insecurity that a minority feels in the face of a majority is a very real problem which we don't easily understand you know it's a very real problem and, and uh, a lot of us who belong to a religious ma majority don't can't really understand you know the sense of victimhood that minorities have it has often been uh, discussed whether cinema represents what's happening in the society rather than sometimes controlling what is happening in the society for example uh, films which depict lavish marriage ceremonies etc they gen then rub off onto the audience uh, the public and they start doing that uh, what is your comment on that you mean uh, the lavish marriage scenes in movies oh yes but, uh, but they they become models for today's rich because you know i mean it's a, it's a wonderful model because look at look at how influential for instance the kind of clothes you know a designer like ritu berry or uh, one of these ladies uh, wouldn't be doing well if it wasn't for the fact that you have these lavish wedding ceremonies and movies because you know everybody wants they, they they want to model themselves on the basis of that i couldn't i couldn't quite get with the point you were making hmm? was it Well, of course it does because you know manipulates not in control but manipulates of course that's that's the power you see that's the power media has media has power to manipulate which is why you should be conscious people who are dealing with media or creating you know programs or whatever they have to become more conscious of what they're doing I want to know what made you get into filmmaking one and well, who's your favorite <laughs> who's your favorite film director and which is your favorite film that um, you see what made me become a film director is a very long story because I was very very small when I decided I was going to be a filmmaker so I don't know I, I can't even remember except uh, to say one thing which which has been with me um, uh, which remains with me the sense the ability to create an alternate reality you know the fact that you're able to create an alternate reality that you the, the fact that you can play god you know is the most attractive thing so that's why you want to become a filmmaker you know so that 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 was the reason because you know at whatever age it was about say, at the age of 6 and from then on i didn't want to do anything else except make movies but who's my favorite filmmaker well i have many but just now just now it's pedro almodovar <laughs> when uh, sees in the news a lot about film premieres and other events uh, happening abroad which makes it clear that the uh, popular filmmakers are also looking at diaspora as a market and the concept of nationalism about change and all that is very different amongst diaspora than it is in india how is this tension handled funnily enough I don't think nationalism is such a big issue within India as much as it is with the NRS. You know their sense of wanting to be the sense of making connections with the mother country is is a very strong feeling. I think that's one of the reasons why our films are so popular with them. Is because you know at the, let's say 10 years ago our total market that is if you took 100 as the figure of the market 20 came from outside of india now it shared 50 50 you know the 26 million south asian indians really who, who live who are part of indian diaspora outside contribute to 50% of the revenues of indian cinema today 
It's extraordinary, you know. Uh, like, uh, I'd like to mention two new, like, young actors. One is Ram Gopal Arma and one is Madhur Mandraka. Like, if you look back their biographies, these two directors have a peculiar characteristic. They learned filmmaking by uh, working in a video library. Now, it, and these two uh, filmmakers could be considered as example who tried to make uh, a different kind of cinema, a sensible cinema, and were also able to sell it. Now, if you talk in terms of context of, like, FTI, like, it has been years, like, there for, like, 20, 25 years, and uh, how many kind of filmmakers there were, uh, it was able to produce who were able to make a sensible, intelligent cinema and also able to sell it. Doesn't it tell something about the film, kind of film education we have in India? No, it isn't quite like that. You see, there are filmmakers who become filmmakers for other filmmakers. Not necessarily, they do not necessarily impact on an audience, but they often impact on other filmmakers. This, this is what happened with the early bunch of people who came from the FTI. You know, their films didn't have too much impact on the audience, but they had tremendous impact on younger filmmakers, you know, at that time. Now, of course, the, the situations like you talked about Ram Gopal Varma and uh, Madhur Bhandarkar, but you have people like, say, for instance, a filmmaker like Mani Ratnam, for instance, a very accomplished filmmaker, who never trained to be a filmmaker. You know, he did business administration or something. You know, he's from Bajaj's, um, you know, the Institute of Management in Bombay. But he became a filmmaker because he was influenced by films made by other filmmakers. You know, this happens to people. So you, one doesn't know, I'll have to ask Mani one day, what were the films that really uh, influenced him eventually to become a filmmaker? Uh, you spoke of the multiple identity of Indians as something of a unique uh, characteristic. But to a lesser extent, is it not really true of uh, other nationalities also? And particularly in the context of the formation of the European Union, where the this kind of multiple identities may become really something which is even more relevant in the days to come. They are looking for that. I mean, the whole attempt at the EU is to, I think, to look for, to have a kind of European identity. If you look at Europe as a nation, <coughs> because if you look at India as a nation, it's like looking at Europe as a nation. But it was Europe that split into nations, you know, with, with, the, with the kind of definition of ethnicity, religion, language. It was Europe. I mean, ultimately, it started from there, you know, early 19th century onwards. That's when the, the, the whole nation-state idea based on those definitions actually started. If it is reverting back, they are actually, we become a model for them, you know, in many ways. <clears throat> so my question is, today with movies like Rangde Basanti, focusing on secular nationalism, do you see the youth of India creating a new wave in terms of what we can achieve with silent protest marches? Because when the Jessica Lal case happened, the media drew a lot of parallel between Rangde Basanti and what the country did. So how do you think the youth is working towards this? Well, you see, films have that kind of impact. You know, Rangde Basanti was designed as an entertainment vehicle, but eventually it impacted on the audience in so many different ways, because young people started to identify with this whole, whole bunch that was in that movie, you know. But the interesting thing is they could identify with it in a way that they wouldn't be able to identify with politics and politicians, you know? So it's very interesting because it's a, it's, a, it's a kind of, they saw it as a movement of civil society, not as political groups or political uh, formations and so on and so forth. So I think that was a very interesting thing, like, like Lagero Munabai, because it's had little, little impact of its own kind, because just now in Bombay, there are, there are, there's, there are two groups who are um, holding dharna, but very interesting kind of dharna with, you know, with, the, with the two buildings where uh, the builders took money from them and didn't give them the flats and they sold to other people as well. So, you know, so you have these people and eventually they will not give up. You know, they will stay there because until the government starts to respond. So, you know, that, and that was the impact of a film. Um, 
As you obviously know, there are various techniques in films, such as flashbacks, set dressing, and so on. Um, personally, how conscious are you of the usage and the effects of these techniques, as opposed to having a certain style which you just normally apply? Well, you see, I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm not designing anything for how it's going to work and stuff like that. What is important to me is just two or three basic values. And for me, the most basic value is that I have no right to say life has no hope. I'll never make a film which says that living is useless. You know, that pessimism of that kind. Some filmmakers do that, thinking that it has a tremendous dramatic impact. But then I, I believe that as a filmmaker, you have no right to say that. You know, on what basis do you say that life is useless? If you thought that life was useless, then you should remove yourself from life before you even think of making a statement like that, you know? <clears throat> we can take two more questions. One brief question from Mr. Gopal and then from the young friend. Uh, again, I compliment for an excellent thought-provoking lecture, which you could make many of us to think again. <coughs> Sir, this is about uh, post-9 uh, post by 11, when you see at the, at the Hollywood movies or uh, many of the movies coming from the West. Uh, some movies uh, subtly uh, hinting every Muslim as a terrorist. What you see in the newspapers, in the mainstream press, it, any activity which is considered as a terrorism is, is shown as a from, a from a minority community, whether it's Muslim or, or if you take the uh, Iraq. So how do we visualize the future of Indian cinema vis-a-vis -vis secularism? Because here you mentioned about films like Border and uh, uh, like that. When certain values are projected as, as accepted, when I refer to a, a movie like Guru, and I was uh, saying Guru, I was uh, remembering Siri Chasobis. How the whole value system from uh, Siri Chasobis to Guru. Similarly, the secular, uh, what we saw in Garam Hawa or Tamas, when you see the movies like uh, Border, what do you visualize, sir? Well, you see, one of the things, I haven't seen Guru, so I cannot comment on it, because uh, there is a, some people who saw the film, very close friends of mine, said that they had a sense of, um, there, was a, there was a moral dilemma there, you know, in the sense that you have, success is the most important thing, whatever else, you know, everything else uh, is insignificant. Uh, so there is a, a, a kind of amoral attitude. And this amorality, I think, is also the fact that it's part of a general mainstream feeling in urban India today, because success has become the most important value. You know, you have to be, <clears throat> you have to be successful. <clears throat> it's not important that you should be right or that you should have any kind of value other than the fact that you are successful. You know, so it, that, is, that is an aspect that is worrying me a little as a filmmaker or as a human being, as a concerned human being, because it's a, it is a worrisome thing. You know, when you make success as the only value and nothing else is as important, then it, you have a problem. And I think urban India is tending towards that kind of a value system, and it's showing up in films. You know, it's showing up in movies. So if that, this is going to, because this, this is something that is going to face us as some kind of a social problem. You know, at just now maybe it's not obvious on the surface, but soon it will become. Okay, final question from my young friend. Uh, may <laughs> Which okay, one? I think, uh, yeah, Muslim is, you see, that is one of those, one of those huge problems how, how far do you take political correctness? Because if you look, one of the tragedies of India, and particularly of urban India, is that if you look at the city of Bombay, we'll give you an example. If you read the daily newspapers, and you find crimes being committed, the majority of the names you will read are Muslim names, you know. 
But if you saw it out of context, if it, 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 this is not contextualized. Because if you look at the context, you will find that the largest incidence of unemployment is among Muslims. Muslims are the poorest communities in the cities. Now, such, such a community, community report has come. You know the state of Muslims. It's like um, Native, I mean, African Americans in America. So if you look at the crime being committed, street crime, whatever kind of crime, most of the people you will find are African Americans, are blacks. You know, and then in India, and on the basis of this, you can't simply say that blacks make for more criminals or that Muslims make for more criminals. Because you have to look at it in uh, context of how what the community has been faced with, you know, over a long period of time. Which is why, you know, that Lani Guinier, who is actually an African-American wo woman herself, she was an advisor to President Clinton. You know, she is the one who said that, like the coal miners canary, you know, because you, you can tell the health of a society by looking at its minorities. So, uh, given the time Ray, Ghatak and Sen made their films, even uh, very few of the films actually touch upon these minority things. I mean, like the partition in the 70s and it's close to Bangladesh. But uh, if you see their films, even Ghatak made many films on partition, but very, f I mean, on most of the perspective is from Hindu and all these people coming this side, I mean. Uh, so, that's, I mean, what is your comment on that? No, is that a question you're asking? Yeah, I mean, uh, so, I mean, uh, if you say their films, I mean, and as it's representative of Indian films, but, uh, I mean, they sort of, uh, like, also... When you say they, who, who are you meaning? This, uh, like, Satit, Ray, Ghatak, and yeah. Shen, I mean... Right. But Ray, of course, never made a film with anybody except uh, Hindus, <laughs> you know. And he did have Christians in a couple of films, but n they never really played the main part. Maybe because it wasn't part of his, uh, with Gaurav Bhairi, he touched upon, yes, a relationship there. But otherwise he didn't. Neither did Rithik nor did uh, uh, Minal in that sense. But you see, they, they didn't have that kind of experience, strangely enough, you know. They, they, didn't, they didn't share in that experience. For themselves, they didn't share that experience. The refugee problem, the refugee problem, the refugee problem certainly. At the partition of Bengal, which became the trauma for him, he could never get rid of it in any film that he made. It was, it was referred to in one way or another. Of course, I, I grant that. But it did not relate to the communities, you know, because it wasn't like dealing with Muslims, you know. It wasn't doing that. And to make Muslims or the main characters or the protagonist in your film, that is a very recent phenomenon. Because imagine, I wouldn't have been able to make a film. To give you an example, early in my career, I wouldn't have been able to make a film like Zubaydah. I wouldn't have been able to make a film. If I had made it, then the film would have failed. You know, it had to be made in 2000 so that it would succeed. Because there's an acceptance, audience acceptance, you know. Today it's easy. It's like during the time of partition, most of our Muslim actors had Hindu names. You know, Yusuf Khan was the Lipkumar. You know, you had a chap called, who called himself Suresh. He was a Muslim. There's so many people. You know, I mean, people who played um, um, roles like Ram and Lakshman. You know, Ram and Lakshman in that famous Ram Rajya, very famous film made in nine, early 1940s, uh, the only film, I think, seen by Gandhiji because he hadn't seen any other film. This was the only film he saw. And in that, you were the, the, the man who played Ram happened to be a Muslim. And the man who played Lakshman happened to be a Gujarati Christian. You know, so, but that's India, you know, that's, that's the marvelous part of it. But in those days, you didn't, they, they, there was always the fear because the business, that is the people who put money into the film, always worried that they, if you had a Muslim, the original Muslim name, then there'd be a problem with audience's acceptability. But that is no longer a problem, as you can see. I mean, all our big heroes in India today are all Muslims, you know, of the younger generation, whether it's Shah Rukh Khan or Amir or Salman or whoever, you know, except for one Rithik. <laughs> <laughs>
Professor P. K. Shetty to give a formal vote of thanks. Professor Shetty has been coordinating the Associates Lecture for many years now, so he's a more appropriate person to give a vote of thanks. Thank you, Dr. Sangeeta. Secularism has been an integral uh, to India's democracy for more than 50 years. Its uses and limits are being debated anew. A pluralist country like India needs secularism like lifeblood and is necessary for this country to survive as a nation. If India moves away from a secular creed, it may disintegrate into chaos and destroy everything that is built with difficulty. Today, Sri Sham Benagal in his talk rightly endorsed, pluralism is the unifying force in the country. Earlier, despite many cultures, there was a unifying force in this country. Unfortunately, in the recent years, the concept of unifying force has been politicized. Indian cinema has a role in promoting secularism. Movies such as Mogale Azam, Lagan, Rang De Basanti, Fiza, Bombay, and others celebrated the pluralism and the secular creed of free India. But this has been narrowed and moved away from movies like Barder, Gadar, and others. Friends, Sri Sham Benegal, in his uh, talk, brought out lucidly many issues associated with secularism and Indian cinema. We need more individuals like Sri Benegal to promote secular fabrics in this country. On behalf of our director, Dr. Kasuri Rangan, associates of this institute, participants of this uh, 21st course for senior executives, and also my colleagues, I express my deep sense of gratitude to Sri Sam Benegal for accepting our invitation and delivering an outstanding lecture. Thank you. If, if I could speak on behalf of the participants of the 21st NIAS course for senior executives on excellence in leadership, indeed it was a splendid evening for all of us. And sir, your words have left us very interesting ideas to munch on for the coming few days. Uh, let me now request uh, Director to offer a memento to you on behalf of the course participants uh, as a gesture of her appreciation. Thank you all. <laughs>